Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the in the great country of Canada here today. Um, this is the 17th CVMA Veterinary Town Hall Series. Uh, it's going to be on navigating through COVID-19. I am Chris Bell. I am the president-elect uh, CVMA right now, and uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce today's webinar. Um, so we've been doing these webinars uh, now since about early 2020, and um, you know, we've been dealing with COVID uh, throughout the, the entire time. So hopefully these have, uh, have been helpful. And, um, and if you have any feedback, you know, we look forward to it, of course. So I um, want to introduce, we are very fortunate to uh, be able to provide you with some expert, expert information today and advice um, for all the veterinarians across Canada. Uh, today we have our host, uh, Dr. Scott Weiss, who will be um, uh, very familiar to everybody. Um, He's been in all the previous town halls, as well as the Worms and Germs blog, which I'm sure everybody has looked at over the course of 2020 and 2021. Um, he is also uh, the very first ever recipient of the CVMA Outstanding Achievement Award. Uh, in addition to all of that, he is a veterinary internist, a microbiologist, and a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, professor at OVC and zoonotic disease public health microbiologist uh, for the University of Guelph Center for Public Health and Zoonoses. He is also the Chief Infection Control Officer for OVC and holds a Canadian Research Chair in Zoonotic Disease. So without further ado, I will uh, let Dr. Weiss take over here and um, we'll uh, put up here for- Great, thanks Chris. There you go. And it is recorded. Okay. Okay, I should have some slides up now. So thanks for joining in to whatever version this is. I'm not sure where we're with these. Uh, I was gonna pull up the chat too. So I don't have a ton of content today. Um, so we'll see how much discussion there is. What I wanted to go over is a couple of things. I'm gonna give an update on deer. Um, just because you may have heard about deer and there are gonna be a lot of questions about it and people are out hunting now. So they may bring out some other questions. So what's going on? Deer is the big animal change probably. Uh, the other big animal change would be um, phasing out mink in, in different areas, but deer are the ones we have the most new information. And talk about rapid antigen testing, because this is something that, you know, we get asked a, a lot about how or if we should be rolling this into clinic operations. And then just some miscellaneous things about uh, reopening general control practices, whatever, while we're in a clinic. So toss things in the chat as you go. I'll keep an eye on that um, as we go, and we'll, we'll try to get answered whatever you want. So the deer story is interesting. If you haven't been you know, listening to it, this one this is the one that caught me off guard, I guess. You know, there are species we were worried about and there are species we were watching. And we've always talked about this being a wildlife concern. And what we want this is to be a human disease. I've said this probably lots of times during these town halls, but if we keep it in people, at least we know how to control it. It's controlling it in people. If it gets into animals, then you know eradication is gone. I think we that door is long since closed anyway. But if it's in animals, we have you know, a more complex epidemiology. And maybe the bigger concern is you have the potential for variants. So new variants emerging in wildlife that can then come back into people. So that's why we wanted this to stay in humans. And we've been looking at different domestic animal species, obviously, and some wildlife. And deer is the first study came out a little while ago showing deer are susceptible experimentally. So when deer are expect, infected experimentally, they can, they're, they're a competent host. You know, the virus replicates within them. They can spread it deer to deer with direct contact and they can spread it deer to deer uh, vertically as well. So this raised an issue, okay, well, they're one of many susceptible species, maybe they're not gonna get exposed, but you know, if they get exposed, then there's potential concern. And deer live in you know, big populations and they move around. So if you got it into a deer, maybe you could see it spreading around the population. And that was a bit of a theoretical risk at the start. And then there's a study that came out not too long ago uh, out of the US showing antibodies in a lot of deer. And what they did is they're looking at antibodies um, in blood from deer from a variety of different states across the US. And you can see that on the graph here, these orangish dots are positives and the blues are negative. And you, you know, as you'd expect, for pre-2020, there shouldn't have been any positives, but a lot of positives in 2021. And this is multiple deer populations in multiple US states. So it's not like one group got infected and spread it amongst themselves in that group got sampled. This was fairly widespread testing. Uh, and overall, it was about 40% of samples from 2021. 
again, from multiple areas. So that was, you know, first thing I thought is, okay, well, does the test actually work, right? But then you look at the, the yearly distribution data and it would suggest that it probably does. And the testing they're using secondarily, the virus neutralization test uh, is a pretty solid test. So this looks to be real, you know, we can't rule out cross reaction with another coronavirus, but that probably would have had to emerge at the same time for these results to be real, right? For this just to have hit in 2020 and 2021. So this, you know, did seem to be more and more convincing, strange as the stories that might be. And then two things kind of, you know, wrapped it up. Uh, there was an initial report of this virus in a deer and finding the virus. So PCR is what we'd assumed. There wasn't much information on that. And then more information on that. So finding actual virus, finding PCR uh, in lymph nodes in particular, in deer in these areas. So it's been pretty convincing that at least in the US, this virus has moved into deer and it's spread within the deer population. Now, what it does there is the big question, right? So are there enough deer that this virus can keep propagating or is it gonna get into a group, you know, that most of them get exposed, most of them get infected, but then it burns out. So for us to be really worried about a reservoir, you need to have a susceptible species like we have. They need to be able to transmit it like they can, but you need enough of them for that transmission to keep going. And that's why we don't have much concern about things like cats, because in households, that infection is going to burn its way out versus large populations, mink on a farm, deer in the wild. So the big question right now is what's the epidemiology going to be? Is this going to continue to transmit or is it, you know, it gets in, they get exposed, they recover and they're done. And we don't really know. And obviously we don't know it's what Canada right now. There's some work uh, being geared up for that. Is there a situation here that's very similar? We don't know. So what are the risks? Well, we don't know. Do hunters have a risk when they're handling deer, deer carcasses, people that are processing uh, deer that have just been hunted? Are there any risks there? Is there any risk from direct transmission back into people? Is the risk, risk from deer transmission to other susceptible wildlife species? And we really don't know a lot of these things. The other big question that comes up is, well, how the hell did it happen, right? How did deer get this infected in this many states in the U.S.? So there had to be multiple entrances of this into the deer population, right? It didn't spread across the U.S. within a few months in deer. And we don't really know. You know, I made some comments online saying, and there's not really that much direct contact between deer and people. And then I got flooded with pictures from people that live in you know, suburban areas where they've got 10 deer on their front lawn or their dogs having a nap right next to the deer. So, you know, there, there is relatively close contact of people and deer in some areas. Now, wastewater has been mentioned as a possibility. It's probably not a big concern. Um, we use wastewater for surveillance and we're looking for RNA. As far as we know, we don't have viable virus in wastewater. It's not been really well investigated, but while we can detect the virus by PCR, we don't think that's viable virus. So it's probably not wastewater. Can't say that for sure. Um, so it probably is direct contact with people or maybe another animal bridge, but that's work that's ongoing. So it's an interesting story as we got people in contact with deer right now in the bush uh, hunting, that's certainly gonna raise some issues and the Canadian surveillance I think will tell us a little bit more. Uh, and just you know, if you have questions about deer, toss them in, we can address them as we go. This kind of leads into the, the whole issue of what wildlife species are susceptible. And I've gone over some of these before, so I'm not going to go over the whole range of what animals are susceptible and what aren't. But the fact is a bunch are. Um, this is a study that looked at you know, a relatively small number. They captured some wild animals, they exposed them to the virus, and they found out whether they were susceptible. Uh, meaning did they get infected, did they shed the virus, and did they see or convert? So the virus did something inside them. Mice, we've known some species of mice are susceptible, bushy-tailed wood rats, striped skunks. You know, we don't have a lot of direct contact with striped skunks outside of rehab. Raccoons were negative, it was only three, but that was good because raccoons have been a concern all the way along in terms of wildlife and a species that lives in close confines with us and there are a crap load of them, right? If you get infected, an infected raccoon, that's when you certainly could see the potential for nice self-sustaining transmission within a population. And as far as we know right now, they're not a concern. The disclaimer we put on a lot of this stuff is the experimental studies are largely pre-Delta, pre-Delta variant, or basically all pre-Delta. Often they're pre-alpha. This is work that's done with wild type, the original Wuhan strain. And we do know that there can be some change in host range with different variants. And it's been shown with some lab mice. Mice that weren't susceptible to one, to the original strain were now susceptible to the variants. You know, I don't imagine we're going to see major shifts in susceptibility. So a species like cattle or pigs that are really, really minimally susceptible to this virus probably aren't going to become highly susceptible and be a risk. 
But we have to put the disclaimer in, in all our discussions of well, what is susceptible and what isn't because we're, we're always playing catch up. Experimental studies are always going to be months behind because of their complexity. So we're looking at strains that may not be out there right now. Uh, there's a predominant strain or really even not at all. Uh, just pause the chat for a second. What about wild bats in Canada and the US? So there's been a little bit of study in different types of bat species. Uh, bats are a really wide range of species, as you know, um, and some are highly susceptible because that's where we think it came from, the, the Chinese horseshoe bat. What has been found with most of the other bat species that have been looked at apart from that kind of closely related group is they don't seem to be susceptible. This doesn't seem to be a virus that can infect, you know, bats as a big group. It's a fairly narrow range of bats. Now, not all bat species have, have been tested. And again, that's pre-variant. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. This is why there's been a lot of concern about field research involving bats though, because that was largely shut down last year and it's still being controlled quite a bit in a lot of areas because we don't want to take the chance of infecting our bats. So what we don't want to do is have someone go in and they're shedding virus and then they expose a bat group, bat colony. And then, you know, we create a big self-propagating group of animals that could sustain transmission. So as far as we know, um, it doesn't seem to be a risk in North America. There's still some work going on in that, at least as far as I know, I don't think we have any susceptible species, but there still is a lot of concern uh, and good precautions being taken to make sure that we don't kick it out into that population. Can we assume all deer species are susceptible? It's a great question. We don't know that right now. This is all the white-tailed deer. Um, and again, you know, closely related deer, you know, if we look at felids, you know, a whole range of fields are highly susceptible to this virus, whether it's lions, tigers, cougars, jaguars, domestic cats, whatever. So, you know, we're not saying it's going to be just one genus and species within a group. So we have to have some concern of various deer species being susceptible. And we just don't know. The deer story is still relatively new. Experimental work is really difficult, really expensive, and it's not going to be done on a wide range of species. So we're left with surveillance. Uh, to pick up some of these things. And surveillance is, you know, it's expensive and it's hit and miss. Uh, so we are quite spotty with what we know about different species. Has it been shown in Canadian deer? I don't, not sure any testing has been done yet. There's been gearing up for testing. I've talked to some groups that are getting ready to do it. Um, it's usually opportunistic testing uh, that's, that's coinciding with other deer surveillance. But there is work that's going to be done fairly soon if it's not underway right now looking at deer population in Canada. And again, Canada is a big group, right? big area. So, you know, we need to look at different populations, especially those that have maybe a greater chance of having human contact. So deer that live in a densely populated area in southwestern Ontario might be different than deer that live in an area farther north where there's, where there's less contact. So I, there'll be a lot more, I think, to, to report in this space in the future, um, but not a lot more right now. So that was my animal update. And if there are any other questions about the animal side, we still know that, you know, cats are highly susceptible. Dogs are moderately susceptible, don't usually get sick. The one other animal thing I can comment on is I talked about it before in one of our town halls. Uh, and this paper just got published. So it's created another kind of stink in the press. This is a study out of the UK that was implicating the alpha variant with myocarditis in dogs and cats. And it's one of these that, you know, surprised it got published. It was a pretty weak study. So what they did is it was a clinic that made, you know, a valid clinical observation. They thought they were seeing more myocarditis cases. And this is the same time that alpha was causing problems in the UK. And we know there's a risk of myocarditis with COVID in people, a, a pretty significant risk. So they started looking at it and they tested some animals with, that they diagnosed with myocarditis and they found a reasonably high infection rate in those. And these were animals from households where people had COVID because that's obviously what they're worried about. Now, the problem is that the prevalence they found in those animals with myocarditis from COVID households was pretty much bang on or actually lower than the prevalence we find in healthy animals from households where the people have COVID. So, you know, is there more myocarditis going on or are there people paying more attention to it, looking for it more? And it's just coming out of that one group and talking to cardiologists uh, in various other places, I haven't had anyone that's, you know, suggested there's a signal out there. And if we look at, you know, our dog and cat data from, from what we have and from other places. So with our serological data, about two thirds of cats that live in households where someone has COVID get infected based on serological data. And that's not too far off some other studies where you're looking at 50% plus 
dogs a little bit lower, but we're still looking at a 25 to 45% range in different studies. You know, if, if even half, right, if half of the cats living in COVID positive households, and we've got a lot of households that have had COVID in North America, you know, if half of them get infected, if this was a significant cause of myocarditis, we'd probably see more of a signal, we'd see more concern. And we're just not hearing reports of that. So if people ask you because they've seen it in the press, because there's another round of, of publicity about it. It's something that, you know, I presented as it's really good hypothesis generating information, right? They observed something that sounded off, right? And now that means we need to look at it more. But I think it jumped a little bit far saying, okay, there's more myocarditis because there could be a big surveillance bias. You know, and some of these animals were positive. A lot of animals were positive and it's, you know, too much link those things together. But if you get asked about it, it's certainly something that we're, we're not dismissing, but we don't have a good link or a good indication that infection of animals is going to lead to myocarditis in dogs and cats. Ms. Before I keep tossing things in the chat, uh, really quick update here, and this kind of leads into the antigen testing component. That's why I put this in. So if we look what's happening now in various countries, um, you know, you're seeing lines going up, and typically with infectious disease, we don't like seeing lines go up. And one thing that's common for these countries tends to be fairly high vaccination rates. You know, not complete, but high vaccination rates and in most of these loosening of public health measures because of the high vaccination rates and because their levels were down low. To put Canada into perspective, here's where we are right now with this red dot, the US is lower uh, as well. So you've seen countries that have had done a very good job of controlling this um, and countries that have had a very good success with vaccination. Again, still there's that large enough fraction that's driving problems. So what, what this is showing us is, you know, we're in, we're down here. So there is some place to go if we're not careful. And it shows us that, you know, we can't completely vaccinate our way to this outbreak uh, pandemic because not everyone's getting vaccinated and because public health measures are still important. So when we start thinking about where we are in the pandemic, what we're doing, in different provinces in terms of restrictions we need to think about that in terms of what we do with restrictions and clinics because you know just trying to abandon public health measures um hasn't worked and that's not even abandoning this is loosening measures so to, to, to put that into context we need to think about what else we can do to reduce the risk of transmission while we're maximizing what we can do with clinics so that, that leads into what i want to talk about kind of most is rapid antigen testing um, Canada has been a laggard with rapid antigen testing. This is used a lot more readily in a lot of countries. There have been a couple of countries that have done basically national surveillance where they, they sample a huge percentage of the population on a given day to get a snapshot. There are places where it's used routinely in schools, in workplaces, um, and there are different ways it can be applied. And I'll come to that in the next slide or two. So as you know, this is different than PCR testing. So these are kind of like the snap test that we have, right? So something that you can do in your household, in your workplace, within a few minutes on a nasal swab, on a saliva sample, different types of samples, but something that can be done without a lot of expertise. You don't need a diagnostic lab. You'd maybe don't even need someone with any training to run the test. And it varies depending on the test. Some of these need someone that's got, you know, to say high school education. They have to be able to understand, you know, a little bit of, of operation of test versus some are, are, you know, pretty straightforward, you know, stick the swab up there and then stick it into them. So they're meant to be kind of easy, relatively cheap, accessible tests that you can put anywhere. And the big thing to remember is they're designed for testing on asymptomatic individuals. Rapid antigen testing is a surveillance tool. It's not a diagnostic test. Um, so overall, these tests have lower sensitivity than PCR. And I'm going to come back to what positive and negative really mean. But that doesn't mean the tests aren't very good. It means we need to think about how we use them and where we use them. Because what we're trying to do is reduce the number of infectious people that are in population. So, you know, perfect sensitivity, perfect specificity is ideal, but we want to identify those people that are pumping out a lot of virus, the ones that are posing a risk versus, you know, we don't care as much about someone who's got a little bit of viral RNA, they're really low viral load that might not pose any risk. So overall, the tests vary quite a bit, sample collection methods vary quite a bit, but they tend to have a good sensitivity, you know, 80 to 95%, and they tend to have very good specificity. And the very good specificity or excellent specificity is really important because we don't see a lot of false positives. We actually see very, very few false positives because false positives are disruptive. Right? If you have a false positive, then the person goes and gets tested, they should be staying away, assume they're positive until they get clear with the PCR test. And false positives actually seem to be very, very rare. 
overall. So they're really designed for healthy populations, lower risk populations in general. And in those, they've got excellent positive and negative predictive values. Um, so we need to think about how we use them because they do have a really good role. And I mentioned before, what does a positive really mean? So we need to think about that because really, we're not trying to say, is there any little bit of virus there or any little bit of viral RNA there that means they've been exposed at some point. What you're trying to do with rapid antigen testing is say, what are the odds this person is posing a risk to others? So PCR, we're looking for RNA. You can look for other types of targets. You can look for infectious virus. With rapid antigen testing, you're, you're looking to see if there's enough antigen there that would suggest you know, the person's probably posing a risk because PCR is really sensitive. And when you're infected with, with this virus, you can have a really, really wide range of viral loads. You can have viral loads into the thousands of copies per mil, which is really small. Right? Viruses are small, a couple thousand copies per mil is a minuscule amount. Or you can have billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of copies per mil. And obviously it makes sense that the more virus that's there, the more infectious you're going to be. And you can have a reasonable amount of virus there um, with limited chance of transmitting it. And general kind of line right now is about 100,000 copies per mil is the rough cutoff for the presence of infectious virus. So if you have less than 100,000 copies per mil, odds are really low you could grow virus from you, which would mean you're infectious. If you got a billion copies per mil, it means like 90 to 100% chance you've got a chance of being infectious or having infectious virus there. And they've also shown that in, in households, you look at the transmission risk where we see the transmission risk coming up high, it, it really is, you get into the billion. So we're looking for the people that are shedding a lot of virus because they're doing most of the transmission. So tr transmission risk in a household hit 50%, went, but you had to have about 10 billion copies per mil. And when you had 1 million copies per mil, only six to 7% risk of transmission within a household. Again, reinforcing, we don't need a test that picks up a small amount of virus. We want a test that's rapid and easy and effective it will pick up these infectious people. Okay, 10,000 virus particles, yeah, it's infected. Yeah, it might be interesting. Yeah, you might ramp up the next couple of days, which is the concern. But right now you probably pose essentially no risk for transmission. So we don't worry if you get a negative test in that situation. So, and again, just to reinforce that, if we look at back, I mentioned here, so PCR, you, you've heard crossing points probably for PCR. Crossing point is an indication, a rough indication of how much virus is there. So the lower the number, the more virus. But 100,000 copies per mil is roughly a CT of 25. So if you have a CT less than 25, we start getting into, there's some chance you've got infectious virus there. You start getting into 10, 12, there's a lot of virus there. Uh, and if you look at the, these rapid antigen tests, you know, if you have a CT value greater than 25, the sensitivity is pretty low, which is fine because, you know, if you have a CT greater than 25, you probably pose limited risk. But if you have a CT less than 25, so the people that are posing risk of infection, sensitivity is actually very good overall for most, most or all of these assays. So hopefully that's not too confusing, but really the take home is Antigen tests have limitations in sensitivity, but those limitations may not be true field limitations. If we wanted to say, I need to know absolutely if this person is infected or has been exposed, I want to use PCR, right? If we're trying to say, what are the odds, you know, this person is infectious or someone we can find multiple people infectious within this group, then antigen testing could be really useful. So there are a variety of ways you can use it. And some of these are better than others. Uh, and a couple aren't recommended. So how do we use rapid antigen testing? And, and you can start thinking about this in the context of a workplace or a school or any other congregate setting. Uh, part of it's just routine screening. So we're gonna screen you know, once a week, whatever. We're gonna screen a bunch of people and have an idea if there's something going on under the radar. This is largely restricted to a higher risk setting. So you got a clinic of six people, it's gonna be pretty low yield say we're going to get some really good surveillance data by looking at our clinic now when you're when you're using it usually looking at a big population an amazon warehouse a school with 500 a thousand kids where you can go and you sample a subset to try to see okay is there a signal here that says something might be going on so we test a random sample or a convenient sample of you know 30 people and you get a couple of positives oh crap something might be going on now we need to get some more education out maybe we need to do targeted testing versus everyone's negative is no guarantee but you know it's a good sign so not really applicable to most of our situations unless you're working in a big workplace. Uh, test to stay. So the, this approach is when you're testing someone that's asymptomatic, but they've been in contact with a positive person. So, you know, I've, I've had this transient contact or, you know, a reasonable contact with someone. 
And can I do this test to say, yes, I can still do what I was going to do in lieu of isolation? Really what it's used more for is for closure decisions in workplaces. So we've got a positive case in a school or in a warehouse. Okay, let's test, test a bunch of people to give us an idea whether this whole population can stay. So I've got a positive kid in the classroom. If we do rapid antigen testing on all the other kids in the classroom, we get a positive or two, okay, they're going home. If we don't, then maybe that classroom can stay while there's you're monitoring for signs and, and investigating it more. So not really in the context of, of what we would do, but you, it, it's and it's a bit riskier, right? Because you're looking at that one point in time in a higher risk situation. You know, where we like these tests are in lower risk situations and in healthy individuals. Uh, test to protect is a little different one. It'd be different than what we would do, but that's testing asymptomatic people in high risk settings. So long-term care facility. So periodic testing of, of workers there, ideally fairly regularly to pick up the odd one that might be infectious because of the potential implications. And sometimes this is just focused on unvaccinated individuals if there's not a vaccine mandate in the high risk workplace. So you're trying to target situations where that one person that sneaks through, you might be able to pick them up and you might be able to have an impact on what they do. Uh, test to play. So this is, and you can have some analogies with this for workplace scenarios. So basically it's the understanding there's some situations where the risk is greater. Close contact sports is the classic one, but it might be working in close confines with someone in a clinic. So we know we've got higher risk activities. So we're screening people to say, yes, you can come in. So, and it, and it might even be something, right? You've got a, a traveling surgeon that's coming in and they're gonna have to work closely with your personnel, you know, putting a catheter, standing in your OR, whatever then maybe you're saying, okay, we're creating a higher risk situation. So we want everyone exposed there to do an antigen test to make sure we're not gonna infect each other. Uh, test to release is, you know, testing to get people out of quarantine quicker. It's not really the ideal route for it. Uh, diagnostic testing, this, like I said before, this is not meant to be a diagnostic test. It's meant to be a surveillance tool. So really where this is used in diagnostic testing is when you can't do a PCR test. So if you're in an area where you just can't get access to it. Um, and then test to stay is the other one. So really um, different type of test to stay, but test to stay for symptomatic people. I should title that one differently probably. And this is what we don't want to use. So test to stay is one thing when you've got healthy individuals, so you're going into a situation, you're a higher risk for some situation where you're clinically normal, the test will perform quite well. What we don't want you to do is have tests to stay in people that have symptomatic uh, signs. So if you have clinical disease that might be attributed to it, this is not a recommended approach. Now, the exception sometimes is when you've got a really low suspicion. So you've got a person we know have, has allergies, and this is the time of year they always get allergies, and the signs they have are classical and just allergies, and they're flaring up today. You could do a rapid antigen test to say, yeah, it's probably just allergies. A number of clinics that have been burned by people that thought they had allergies and actually COVID is actually surprisingly high though. So you have to be really careful with this, but you can do it in situations where you have a pretty good suspicion, the signs that this person has, the symptoms they have aren't attributed to COVID, but we want to pick up the ones that are. And like the allergies is, is kind of a good one. So really how we might use this in clinics or how it can be used is, you know, the, the routine screening probably doesn't help us apart from a big one. If you've had a high risk situation or a higher risk situation, you can consider it from a test to stay. You can consider it as just a routine tool to prevent to protect yourselves, considering it's that test to play or test to protect, right? We know we're working in an area and the ventilation is not very good. And we're gonna be face-to-face -face a lot putting catheters in, or I'm gonna be sitting next to you in the truck doing farm calls with a tech, tech and a vet, things like that, or identifying higher risk situations, then we wanna consider these, or they could be more valuable. Now, how often to do them is off the question, right? Ideally, you do them every day. It's not very practical. If you do them every week or two, you have a big window in between where you might be positive. So a couple of times a week is kind of a nice way to do it if you have access to the tests and the cost. So with these rapid tests, if you do get a positive, you know, it's go home and get a PCR test range. If you're negative and you're asymptomatic, you know, you've got exceptionally low risk of being infected and infectious. If you're negative and you're symptomatic, then it really comes down to what those symptoms are. Uh, like I was saying before, if it's someone that's got classic non-infectious disease, then you know they're probably the same as an asymptomatic person. If it's a person that doesn't usually have allergies or it's a bit out of season or they're a bit worse or there's something else there, then you have to be a lot more wary of a negative result in symptomatic infections. So 
I see a couple of questions coming in, so I'll get to those in just a second. Keep tossing them in if you have other ones. So considerations on how to apply this in a clinic really comes down to a bunch of factors. Uh, cost. You know, can you get can you access them? How expensive are they in Canada? They tend to be a lot more expensive than they are in some places where you can get them for a couple of dollars. Uh, accessibility. Can you find them easily enough? Risk tolerance. Like what level of risk are you willing to accept in the clinic? What do you want to do in the clinic? Do you want to do more closed contact procedures? Do you know you have problems in your clinic with ventilation, with distancing? Knowing the vaccination status of your personnel. So if you have unvaccinated people, you know, they're more likely to be infectious and they're more likely to get sick too. So there's protecting, especially people that can't be vaccinated. This is another way to, you know, test to protect component. Similarly, the risk status of personnel. If you have people that are high risk for serious infection, you know, your thresholds can be a little bit different and you might have more value for these. Uh, ability to implement other control measures. So if you're in a big clinic where you can distance really well and your ventilation is great and you have all these other things, it's gonna be a little less value than in a small clinic where you've got small rooms and your ventilation is not very bad. You've got lots of clients coming in. You've got lots of close contact. You're trying to stay away from clients and we're cramming ourselves together. So it's, it's putting all these things together and then thinking about the local epidemiology. How, how bad is it? How, are things changing? What's the risk someone's gonna come in that's positive? What's the risk someone's going to be exposed? And you can kind of get into the lifestyle of the person there. You, you, you may have people in the clinic that you know, you know, they've got very limited exposure outside the household versus some people that are going to clubs and going to activities when those things start opening up in different provinces and creating more risk. So it's, there's not a simple answer, maybe the take on there, but these are a bunch of the things that you can consider. Uh, and just kind of a last thing. So testing versus vaccination. So testing isn't an infection control tool. It's a surveillance tool. So it's not a situation of test or vaccinate. You know, that was messaged a little bit at the start. And it really wasn't an ideal approach because, you know, vaccination is there to prevent infection and re well, reduce the risk of infection, reduce the risk of in infectivity. Testing is there to identify infections once the person's already infected and once they've maybe exposed some people. So vaccination reduces infection, reduces the risk of infection in the individual in their context. Testing might reduce infection of potential contacts, not their previous contacts. So testing on the way into the clinic, yeah, if someone's positive, it's going to help reduce the risk to people in the clinic if they don't come in. So there is a control approach there, but it's not really a one or the other. And we want to uh, maximize vaccination, vaccinate, maximize other aspects and not rely just on testing. And I think, you know, the White House showed us that last year. They tried to rely on testing as their control in a suboptimally vaccinated and a suboptimal infection control environment. Most of them got sick, despite having a lot of resources and a lot of testing going on. Okay, uh, I'm going to pop back up the questions here. Even in vaccinated staff, use the testing this way. And this comes down to, you know, understanding your staff. So, you know, rapid antigen tests, are more likely to pick up someone that's infectious if they're unvaccinated because they're more likely to be infected. And an unvaccinated person that's infected is more likely to be shedding a lot of virus. So vaccination is gonna reduce your risk of getting infected and it's gonna reduce the amount of virus that you shed in general. So you're gonna have bigger bang for your buck if you focus just on unvaccinated individuals. So it really depends on your clinic, right? If you've got a clinic and a bunch of people that aren't, aren't vaccinated, then you could focus on them. But it still can be used in situations where you've got complete vaccine coverage, especially, you know, as we're getting into a period where we're distant time from that last dose is stretching out. Like this is a three dose vaccine. I think we're wrapping our heads around that and we don't know beyond that what's required, but we're getting into a time we've got a lot of people that were vaccinated quite a few months ago. And, you know, these are really good vaccines, but we do know there is some waiting immunity. So at what point do we start calling people unvaccinated, like if they're a year, if they're two years, whatever down the road from their vaccine, we don't know that right now. So bigger bang in unvaccinated staff, still some value in vaccinated staff. Uh, does anyone know where you can purchase rapid antigen tests? This varies by province. Um, and I can't really say much more. It, it's, it's been a challenge to get them in Ontario. There are some workplace programs that have been set up. They're typically for big workplaces. So if you're a small clinic, you won't usually have access to them, but you have to look in your province. You can also look at your public health unit because they might have some. You can buy some in some stores. You can also get rapid antigen testing done in some pharmacies. So it's getting away from the value of the test, meaning you know it's harder to track it down. Like if, if you can do it in your house, it's gonna get done more often than if you say, okay, we want everyone to go to the shoppers, you know, 
before they come to work on Tuesday, right? That it's gonna be harder and compliance is gonna be poorer and cost is gonna be uh, higher. So that is a big challenge right now. Um, people have been able to find tests in different ways. Sometimes, you know, without the government being very happy with how they do it, because we haven't used a lot of the tests that we have. Um, it's a question about cost. And I don't know. I think cost has been a really big issue in tests. Some province, like provinces have bought this and they've distributed them, but they've also distributed them to, to pharmacies that are selling them. So there are ways to get free tests from some mechanisms. There are ways to buy them. It's all a bit of a mess across Canada right now. Um, so there's a comment there about the rapid screening consortium. Yeah, so there, there are some groups, if you look online, especially in Trail, you'll find some local groups that have been able to source tests. A lot of these have been cracked down on because they're sourcing tests that are meant for big workplaces uh, that aren't being used. Um, so they're letting them use it, but then sometimes when the government finds out, they shut them down. We've had that issue with some testing that was being done in for schools, where a group is able to get a bunch of rapid antigen tests to start doing voluntary testing in schools, and then they lost access to it. So it's really variable. Uh, that's about all I can say because uh, it seems to change with within pro between provinces, even within provinces. I see there's a comment there in Toronto. I have no tr tr trouble getting them, and that would be unusual for most people I talk to. So if you've got a good source, um, use them. It's been a challenge for most. And let's, so let's see if any other questions come through. And this kind of comes back to the whole, you know, moving away from the test or vaccinate policy. This was one of the higher profile things a few months ago when the police sports entertainment said they wouldn't accept the negative COVID test result for events it's vaccination or not, which brings in some equity issues for people that can't be vaccinated for true reasons. Um, but it shows the challenges um, with, you know, what tests do they use? What's, when do they have to get tested? How do they prove the result? And the fact that it's not a control measure, it's a surveillance tool. So, you know, they, they, they do have a role, um, but they can't be used in, in lieu of vaccination. And kind of just to, to wrap up, like sick personnel, these tests are not for sick people, right? If people are sick, they should be getting tested through a PCR test. Uh, you get a false negative result. You get a poor sample because you're collecting your own sample. It could be below the detection threshold at the time of sampling, but not some other time. So they might be just ramping up. Uh, it could be something else relevant, like influenza. And the other thing you run into problems with rapid antigen tests is people are doing it on their own. So if you're trying to use, if you got someone that, you know, that you're worried about their status and you're worried about them being honest about their status, well, how do I get an easy rapid antigen test? Well, I don't stick the swab in my mouth or my nose. I just use it right away or I run it underwater, right? So there are issues with that too. Um, so again, take home is sick people stay home. Um, the exception being the people that have a really convincing illness that's probably not infectious. And you're using this just to the extra level of assurance that, yeah, this is your allergy acting up not something else um let's see if there's anything else in there a couple other comments about testing programs so yeah I think the biggest thing i can say for that is talk to your local health unit let's see what's in your area because it, it varies a lot and around here uh, it's been hard to find some so reopening considerations this is kind of this this similar stuff from before so i'm not going to belabor it and we can talk about any details if you want really it's thinking about the whole package like right? um you know, vaccine coverage in your area. So what's the risk someone that's coming in is infectious? Vaccine coverage in your personnel. So what's the risk of someone in the clinic that's going to infect someone they're in contact with or be more susceptible to getting infected from someone that comes into the clinic? Uh, the variant of a concern or just the epidemiology of disease in the area, how much is going on? Uh, ability to optimize your infection control practices and ventilation. It's all similar stuff to the, the antigen testing discussion. Your risk aversion, your risk tolerance, the risk status of the people in the clinic, and your ability to use hybrid measures to kind of ease things in. And what we don't really want to do is go from zero to 100. It's nice to be able to ease things in while we're seeing what happens. And then there are obviously some other practical considerations, like yeah, how much parking do you have? What's the weather like? You know, are people going to be able to wait outside? Can you get, can you do drop off easily enough? Um, and that can impact things obviously as well. So, you know, for me, I think it's a matter of trying to figure out what's best for the clinic and, you know, the fear of staff is another one. 
I guess I didn't mention that there, but I know we all know clinics where we've got people that just want the doors open. They want to see people. They want to get back to normal. And we've got lots of clinics that are the exact opposite. They don't want anyone to come back in the clinic like ever again. They'd be happy with that. And, you know, we've got a lot in the middle, but trying to figure out, you know, how can we do things in the clinic to make sure that we're reducing the risk, that our staff are happy, they feel safe, uh, and that we're maximizing the animal care. And hybridizing this, obviously, is one way we can do that by trying to keep people out that don't need to be here, still facilitating curbside. Uh, using telemedicine as much as we can, um, trying to conduct examinations without the client in the room. So the animal goes into the waiting room, or sorry, the exam room with the client, and then we take the animal to the back, do our thing, pop back in, talk to the client, show them what we need to do. So we're minimizing that contact with the client uh, and that client's airspace. Because it really comes down to, you know, the three C's I've talked about ad nauseum, but we need to think about these within the clinic as our risk aspects and what we need to control. So closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people and close contact. So what do we try to do? Well, for crowded places, we try to minimize the number of people that are in the clinic at any given point, right? And, you know, curbside telemedicine can help with that. Scheduling can help with that. Um, you know, people not coming in to pick up food, having other ways for them to get food, medications can help with that. Close contact settings. And that means, you know, when you have people in the, in the clinic, how close are they? So not having people congregating in a waiting area, not having people congregate at your reception desk, um, keeping, you know, owners in an exam room while we do work out in the back, everything we can do to, to distance, you know, airborne aerosol are still a big issue, but distance plays a role in that. And then closed spaces with poor ventilation, avoiding those. So improving ventilation, keeping doors open. I'll talk about ventilation at the end if we have a little bit of time. Um, but thinking about all those things, how do we you know, reduce closed spaces, reduce crowded, crowded places, and reduce close contact within those? So for me, it's really focusing on, you know, we still want to focus on vaccination, right? If all our staff are vaccinated, the implications to the clinic of someone coming in that's infected are going to be lower because we're less likely someone's going to get infected. And less likely someone's going to become infectious and you know expose us still our biggest risk in a clinic is probably going to be co-workers because we just don't distance from them as well sometimes we can't and you can sit with them in break rooms we get close for procedures so the more we can have everyone in the clinic protected through vaccination the better um, ventilation you know I keep saying this but ventilation is key and we're learning this more and more the more we can optimize ventilation in the clinic the better it gets to be a challenge in Canadian winter, right? Because we're not having doors open and windows open as much. It's harder to bring in more fresh air. But we need to think about ventilation. Uh, sorry, this is a clinic. I changed this slide for a shelter talk and forgot to change it back. Reducing numbers of people in the clinic. So overall, like, the more people that come in, the greater risk one of them is infected. And at any one time, because we get to that close contact setting in, in any area. So you could have 10 people in the clinic, but if they're all in the waiting room or they're all in an exam room, that's substantially higher risk than if they're distributed out. Or if they all come in between one and two and no one else comes in the rest of the day, you know, we've concentrated that risk. Distancing, kind of the stuff we've been talking about for a long time, and continued use of PPE. You know, PPE is a bit controversial now. Is at what point do we say everyone should be wearing N95s and wearing N95s properly? At what point do we need eye protection is still a bit of a challenge. Uh, I've mentioned this, I think, last time or a couple of times, but just another reminder that, you know, plexiglass can be useful, but plexiglass can be dangerous at the same time. Um, you know, what plexiglass is designed to do is be a physical barrier. So someone's here on this side, someone's here on that side, and they're talking closely, you know, droplets aren't going through plexiglass, obviously. The problem is plexiglass disrupts ventilation, disrupts airflow. And this is particularly a thing when you see in reception areas. So if you got your reception area and it's kind of fishbowled in with plexiglass, okay, that receptionist to client contact is gonna be fairly low risk, but you're creating potentially this big, you know, gap in your ventilation system. So if a person back there, if one of your receptionists happens to be, happens to be infected, they're breathing into this fishbowl, they're concentrating all these infectious aerosols. So you're creating an exceptionally high risk environment in that area for anyone that happens to come in. So if you pop in there, you have more than one person in there, you're creating a, a poorly ventilated place, potentially inside a well-ventilated facility. So we need to think about ventilation while we're thinking about barriers. And if you had to pick one of the two, I would pick better ventilation versus better barriers. And the ventilation side, um, you know, I've talked about this before, so I won't go into too much, but we're trying to do kind of three things. We're trying to disperse infectious clouds that build up just by airflow. Um, that could be fans, just normal HVAC. We're trying to you know, get rid of 
contaminated air. So bringing in fresh air through your HVAC system, through open windows, through open doors, and then we can filter. And that can be in room, which is really the main thing we focus, you know, above the room and ventilation system filtering really doesn't have that much value. If there are any ventilation questions, I can hit on that after. The other thing on ventilation is, and I've said this many times before, is you know, think about getting a CO2 monitor. Um, CO2 is a good proxy for ventilation, and it'll tell you if you've got areas within your clinic that ventilation is poor, it'll tell you what happens when you open a door, when you change your HVAC settings. You can buy them online fairly cheaply, 150, 200 bucks. Uh, and you might be surprised at some of the values you get and some of the places that are bad. I can tell you hockey arenas are horrible. I've taken one to some games recently and we're getting to toxic levels. So basically no ventilation in some areas. And certainly we, we're going to have the same thing in some clinics where it's just, they're not set up well to ventilate. We're set up for these small spaces, closed doors, where often we cram people in. And just one more thing, cleaning and disinfection. You know, we've been saying this for a long time too, but you know, routine cleaning and disinfection is the key. Once you start letting people in, don't worry about ramping up your cleaning and disinfection that much. It's normal cleaning and disinfection done right. Um, there's a ton of you know disinfection theater that goes on, hygiene theater that goes on, really useless things that take a lot of time, they waste, cost money, and they don't really do much. So if you're starting to let people in, it's not like you need to follow them around with a disinfectant wipe, just use your normal disinfection practices. And I'd rather you focus on ventilation than disinfection. And just one last thing, because ivermectin doesn't really die. Um, and we get asked a lot because we're vets and it's ivermectin. Uh, just the most recent things on ivermectin is just more and more studies being retracted. Basically every study on ivermectin that's shown even some hint of it being effective has been retracted now because of fraud or study design issues. There was one last week where they retracted it because people started looking at the data and realized the data made no sense and it couldn't be real. And the authors said, oh, well, someone put a training set in there, but we made up some data to train a student and it ended up in there, which sounds like completely implausible, but that one's been pulled. Uh, Pierre Corey's had another thing pulled. They had a, had a treatment called Math Plus, which included a few different things. Uh, including ivermectin, and they claimed a 75% reduction in risk. The problem is they didn't count all the people that died in their study group. And actually, the death rate in their study group was probably higher than the death rate overall. This is only flagged because the hospital where this was performed looked at the numbers and said, that's not our numbers. We had more people die than that. So this is the second study that uh, this person's had retracted and used one of the big anti-vaxxer pro-ivermectin uh, groups that are out there. So ivermectin continues to die a slow death from the scientific side for COVID, but it's still very well ingrained uh, in some groups. So um, hopefully people still aren't still asking for your ivermectin, but it, it is happening still. Okay, uh, I think that's all I've got. I was going to just jump to the chat if there are any other questions here. Let me see what I've missed. So where we go? Person will take down their mask when no one else is in the room and put it back up when someone comes into the room. That's a great question. So I, I'm in a small room right now in the university and I take my mask off when I'm in here. And one of the reasons I do that is ventilation is really good. I've brought my CO2 monitor along out of curiosity and CO2 doesn't really budge unless I'm here before 6 a.m. when the ventilation's off, and it gets really hot. So if I was infected um, when the ventilation was off, if someone walked into this room, there probably would be a risk. When the ventilation's on, probably pretty minimal because it's actually got very good ventilation. And I think, and that's the situation I think would come to your example. So if, if someone's in an area, they take their mask down. If you have really good ventilation in that area, the risk is probably pretty low because we're moving that air. If you put a HEPA filter in that area, the risk is gonna be really low because you're filtering that virus out. If you've got crappy ventilation and they're in there for a longer period of time and someone comes in right after, then your risk goes up and up and up. You know, and there's always going to be some risk. There been there was one report from a hospital where someone got infected, and they, they figured it was like 45 minutes later from a bathroom where an infected person had been. Um, that true airborne, where it's staying in that you know in that cloud around you for a long time, is probably a fairly uncommon event. But you know, we're getting more and more information. This is truly aerosol to airborne. So to answer that question, maybe a little bit clearer. Yes, there's some risk. Um, People need mask breaks sometimes. It's better if they can do it outside. If you got an area where people are going to be taking their masks off and someone else is going in, then you really want to optimize ventilation or buy a HEPA filter. We can buy these really cheaply. You plop it in the middle of the room and your risk is going to be really low. And it's, you know, it's these incremental measures. If people are vaccinated, 
and your ventilation is good and they're masked most of the time, then your risk is gonna be fairly low. You can't stay at zero. Uh, if people are wearing a mask when they come into the room, you know, that's gonna drop their risk. It's not gonna eliminate it because you can still be exposed through the eyes and masks we wear are 100% protective, but it, it's layering these things on. Hopefully that covered it. Um, there's a question there uh, about any clinics that have made vaccination mandatory. So if anyone wants to, to comment in, re in response to that, that would be great. Uh, to re re review what measurements on a CO2 monitor mean good or bad ventilation? Yeah, great question. So I'm just gonna shut my screen sharing off there. So normal air, like if you go outside, it's gonna be about 400-ish parts per million. In a really well-ventilated room, it'll stay that. Like, so the room I'm in, if I'm here for an hour yapping like this, it'll budge a little bit from like 420 to 430. It's really minimal increase. Uh, like less than 600 is great. Less than 800 is okay. Start getting above 1,000, I'm getting worried. Uh, the dressing room at the rink we played in last week with the girls hockey team, my coach was 2,500 which is really bloody high. And you will find really high levels like that in areas where you got poor ventilation. So in your clinic, if you get a CO2 monitor, you know, ideally we wanted to have it, you know, realistically under 800, I'd be happy with under a thousand. Then I'm getting more concerned. If you're up in that level, we need to think about other things that we would do. And if you know, if you know your lunchroom is running at, you know, over a thousand, then I'd be concerned that you're starting to, you know, let's people take the, the mask off or let people sit in the room together and eat if they're more than six feet apart, you know, you're layering these risks on. So lower is better, under 800 is kind of where I'd like, under 600 would be I'd like to see, under 800 is probably tolerable. Um, let's see, this question coming about whether or not clinics should be mandating all staff get vaccinated. <laughs> That's kind of the last webinar discussion because we have the lawyer here, which helped a lot. Um, it's still a, it's, it's still a tough area. I, I think you know we try to approach this through education to get people vaccinated, you know, as much as they can. Certainly, places are mandating vaccines, um, and, and there are a reasonable number of businesses that are mandating vaccines. So I think there's ample precedent to it. There, a lot of it comes down to you know, do you want to risk losing the staff? What else can you do? What what else can you do within the clinic? What's the risk status of people in the clinic? I'd like everyone vaccinated. I'm certainly not averse to vaccine mandates. But you'd probably want to think about your situation overall. You might need to talk to your lawyer just because it's a bit unclear. I would say more and more of the stuff that I'm reading is lawyers saying it's not a problem. And if we look at the US, you know, where you're more likely to get away with a challenge in the US, being a little more libertarian. The great example has been some healthcare facilities where they've challenged it and they've lost their lawsuits. But they said vaccine mandates are a perfectly reasonable thing. A little bit different because they're dealing with obviously high risk human populations. Um, but I, I think there is some analogy here. Um, so it's common there. BC has made twice weekly testing in KN95 mask wearing mandatory for unvaccinated staff. Uh, vaccinated staff must wear a mask and choose to opt into rapid testing, but it's not required. And that's not an uncommon approach. Again, it, it's, you know, testing them is better than not testing them. And testing is not a replacement for vaccination. So I think you still need to focus on, you know, as much as we can do to get them vaccinated. And then 95 mask will help if people are wearing it properly. And that's the problem. You have a lot of people wearing a 95 masks that aren't fitting them properly. And then 95 is only really an N95 if it fits right. And ideally, if you can fit tested, but you know, people wearing N95s with the big gaps, that's nowhere near functioning like an N95. So I think that's the point, though. If you got unvaccinated staff, and if you're not mandating vaccination, you bring in other measures. And antigen testing is certainly one of them. And twice weekly is a pretty reasonable approach. And bringing in differential masking requirements or differential, you know, protection requirements is certainly a reasonable thing. Um, Henry saying this, clinics have the same policy. And this is kind of that happy medium or that, you know, less likely to cause hassle medium, but it depends on, you know, the rest of the people in your clinic, how worried they are. Part of it depends on the behavior of that staff member too. If the staff member is not vaccinated, but they're really good with other control measures, then the risk is low. If you've got an unvaccinated staff member who doesn't believe in COVID and is going to rallies and going to, you know, raves and everything like that else, then they're posing a substantial risk. And you might even want to ramp up, you know, more testing, more restriction. Okay, they can't take their mask off to have a break inside, things like that. So you really need to think about it case by case. I might have gotten through all the questions. If there are any other questions I missed, you know, remind me if I didn't see them. But um, so 
I didn't think I had a lot of content, but we went the whole time. So uh, if you have any other questions, as is normal, I'll, I'll put most people can find me pretty easily. I'll put my email in the chat if there are any questions that come up from this stuff or just in general. I answer a lot of COVID's, COVID questions every day. Oh, a question, are there new variants of concern? Um, I'm not really sure. Like Delta really took over. And we have some other variants that have come up and some other variants that, you know, variants of interest. We haven't had one that's really tripped into that big, you know, international variant of concern yet because Delta is really bloody good at what it does. Um, and it's, it's going to be hard for another virus, a viral strain to displace it, but certainly it could happen. Uh, and you see variations of Delta. So, you know, viruses evolve all the time. So you, one of the thing is, are we going to get a new completely different variant or are we going to get Delta that just keeps kind of migrating to be something else? And the latter is certainly happening. So we don't know whether we've got a big change in risk or epidemiology or anything based on a new variant at this point, but it's certainly being looked at. There's a massive amount of sequencing that goes on. Great. I think that might be the end of the question. So like I said, feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions on this or send them through the CVMA. If there's interest, we can keep doing these things. Once you're sick of hearing about it, um, we can stop doing them. Um, appreciate everyone coming in today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Um, great, great information again. <clears throat> Again, if there's any uh, any questions here, real quick, we can hang out for another couple minutes. And yeah, for sure, provide us with feedback if um, if you want us to keep doing these, and if you have a preferred frequency, and any particular topics. Oh, I think uh, sorry, someone said they didn't see my email. I think I actually just replied. To one person for some reason so i'll put the email and hopefully everyone will get it this time you can also get me through university with our website worms and germs blog uh, if you're looking for more information on the animal aspect um if you haven't seen it let's see if i can spell it right worms and germs blog.com as a website i've gone through all the major animal species and, and done kind of here's an update on what we know about them and, I, and a month or so ago i started doing it again because they're getting out of date so if you're looking at information looking for information for different animal species or to send clients if they're freaking out about it. Uh, there's the website in there. It's a non-commercial site, so I don't mind plugging it. Um, with that, I guess, looks like we're done. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day.